Yes, it way. Hello, how are you, woman a giant? <laughs> I'm so excited. That's my favorite Sean Paul song. And uh, he and I go back to when we were in elementary school together. So, you know, I can't, I need rhythm for the other songs. But this one here, I was like, I get the idea, Lionheart, woo, woo. you know, I can do that piece, you know. So, well, I want to just kind of do a little bit of boring stuff on the beginning. Look at them giving me the confidence monitor. How nice. It's lovely. <laughs> Well, let me just do the boring things first. First smile. Okay, there we go. <laughs> We're giving honor to God and all the angels of this house. Uh, honoring my dad, Tommy, who decided to come into the Woman Ignite event. Only he has that kind of courage <laughs> and boldness. And then, of course, my bonus mom, Carlene. And then one of my spiritual parents, Pastor Diane. So I just want to honor her as well as I used to stay at her house all the time. All right. So when you, this woman international day, so I only brought 24 of these. So this is my attitude this year. When you see my, hear my testimony, I'm going to tell you, thou shalt watch me win. Mood 24 seven. You shall watch me win. And you know, I'm going to go through some of my story and some of my things. I just want to kind of encourage you kind of those of you who don't know who I am, just kind of warn you in advance. So you know, you can be prepared because it may shock and awe you. And you may be like, what is this? First of all, the past, I have on pants. That, that would be my pants. Yeah, I'm, these are my pants. You know, so let's just start there. Start there. My little shoes have little diamond things on there. They're glittering. Let's do that too. Let's just, let's, just, let's just make it all hang out, okay? And then, you know, the barn is painted. Yes. You know, I had somebody come, not beat my face. Nobody going to beat nothing. But they did do the makeup on there. And that's where we are. But one of the things that freed me. And this is not in the message, but they told me I had like 50 whole minutes, including question and answer. That's like triple the time. So let's just talk, right? So first of all, Romans 11:13 says this. I, Paul, an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my own ministry. Let's put that in your heart because as women, a lot of times we are taught subconsciously to dumb down and dim down. We're not, we're taught to ask for permission, but Paul says, let me tell you, I know I'm an apostle and I will magnify my ministry. And it goes against the whole grain of, oh, be humble. Let somebody just praise you. Just wait. In there. No, Paul says, no, hold on. I am going to magnify my ministry. The ministry that God gave me, I'm going to own it. I'm going to walk in it. I'm going to be bold about it. I'm not going to shrink back with it. I am an apostle. That's who I am. And so tonight you can say, I am a woman on fire. Woman ignite. Let me tell you, for you to ignite means something had to be dry. That means you have had to have some dry bones, some dry leaves, something that was dehydrated and it's saying, come on woman, use what you have and make it blaze in such a way that people will see it all over the world. So if you are ready to just go with me today, we are going to talk about trials and triumphs and transitions and how can you make your trial into a landing place on a launching space versus it just becoming your defining space. Because if you and I are not careful, the trauma that we have, the trial that we have, we'll get stuck in that moment and in that space, and we won't move forward. So, my name is Sarah. As you can see, that's my dad over there. I look just like him. No, I don't think so. I don't know who I look like. But anyway, they used to teach. I have a brother named Che who used to tell me I was adopted because I was very bright. What he didn't understand is that my melanin was slowly working its way up. Okay. It's, some things are slower than others. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, I, I live in Texas right now, and I'm born and raised here in Jamaica, of course. So let me give you a little bit of my story. So the number one comment that I get from people, they ask me, the co number one question other than, are you Jamaican? Jamaicans look like, I said, back up now, back up. <laughs> back up, back up. <laughs> Maybe you just haven't been outside of your, your, your city, hmm? ma'am, sir? So they asked me, how are you so strong? That's the number one question I get. Pastor Sar, how are you so strong? How do you still make it? How are you so tough? And I'm thinking, tough, wait, hold on. I, it's not like I, I, I signed up and said, Lord, when you find trauma and drama, please deliver it to me. I would love to have all this excitement in my life. Anytime you're looking for a willing person. 
drop it here. I did not do that. What I did do, though, was, Lord, use me. And I'm not sure if that did that. But I told him the other day, pick somebody else. Um, I'm taking back that request. I have different requests now. You don't have to use me anymore. I feel used. I am the used. Okay? <laughs> I am the used. I have maximized my potential on that one. So I just really never, you know, know that I feel strong, right? Because I'm definitely not perfect. Because I'm telling you, things irritate me. Being in a long line irritates me. Being on the road irritates You know, I'm, I'm thinking like strong. No, I think I'm more irritable. And then apparently I think I'm going through some kind of thing like menopause or something. I don't even know what that is. We are all women here. So my two children are kind of like miracles because I never had cycles. But in the last two years, I had consistent cycles. Then now I'm going into some kind of... Men like, what in the world? I didn't have them all this time. It was great to just leave them alone. Like, I never wanted to find them, then to lose them again. So it's been a very strange thing, right? But I didn't want to be strong. I didn't know I was going to be strong. And sometimes in Texas, they call me the bounce back queen. I was thinking I'd have been like the dance hall queen, but they call me the bounce back queen. And I was like, okay, one requires rhythm, the other one doesn't. And so I've been through some dark seasons, some very heavy things, some things that I didn't really even know they were dark because they're so normal to you. You don't know sometimes that it's really abnormal because like scar tissue, you can develop this, this hardness towards it and it becomes such a customary way of living that you don't know that better is available. You don't push yourself past that because you become numb to the actual cycle of trauma. And if you're not careful, what should have been a moment becomes now a whole entire mini-series. Like Mission Impossible 7 and 8. Tom, Tom, Tom. How, 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 when you're 90, we're going to be having Mission Impossible 25. What should have stopped a while back? You are still carrying in because you just find recycled ideas on how to justify being stuck in your trauma. So we use things like, that's just the way I am. You know, you know I'm very direct. No, you are afraid. You are very afraid of being rejected and being hurt and being wounded. So yes, you're rude. Oh, I'm just a leader. No, you're rude. And you don't want to own your rudeness because you're afraid if somebody actually sees who you are and all that you have is who you are. What if they reject the only thing you've got? So before they get there, you cut them off. Trauma. Trials. They let you do it. You know... My dad is here. I didn't even know I almost died as a baby. He had to tell me the story. So from the very beginning, things were happening. Just in the nick of time, my neighbor was bleeding out and something told him, something told him, go check on the baby. And the baby was just lying there bleeding out. Doctor says, man, nick of time. We go and, you know, I didn't know at the time that my mom was on drugs. I was very hostile towards her. She was hostile towards me. But I didn't know. I wasn't aware till much later that she was on drugs. So when she used to try and spank me and I used to run and hide behind my dad and he's doing this, you know, we're doing this song and dance. I don't know. I'm just thinking, you don't like me and I sure don't like you. And that's good. But we've learned to function in the trauma. Thus wasn't her 100% of the time, but the times I'm remembering were the volatile times. So when you're in volatile situations, what your brain is going to do is look for those things to repeat in itself. Just like if you're going to buy a white Audi, all of a sudden you'll see white cars on the road. You'll start noticing every white Audi that exists, right? Because that's what you put it into your brain, the forefront of your mind. So when trauma happens to you and you put that in the forefront of your mind, then what ends up happening is more things come to validate it. Not because it's only there, but because that's what you're looking for. So for me, with my mom, I already had a dislike for her because I thought she was unfair. I thought she was out of her mind. I thought she was aggressive. I had no idea because I'm like six, seven, eight, nine. I'm not supposed to know. So she ends up being on drugs and, and because she's gone and then my dad is gone and he's working and he's all over you know, the place and sending us like postcards and stuff. So we're, we're there kind of by ourselves with an uncle. We have an uncle that used to live with us. Well, then I run away from home. Around 13 years old, my dad comes home one time. Uh, it was Easter 
And I wanted to go down to Ocho Rios because that was the thing to do at that time. I'm like 51 now, going to be 51. And so they had this place called Turtle Twin Towers back in the day -er. All right, those of you who are not that there, it's okay, it's all right. I know it's something, it's Moon Palace or some kind of palace. But anyway, it was Turtle Twin Towers at the time and I wanted to go down there, but I'm 13. So where exactly am I going? But in my head, I'm going anyhow. And so I had this older girl that was encouraging me to go. And I remember getting into this fight with my dad. I don't think I'd ever fought with him since. And I don't I haven't fought with him then. But I told him I'm going. And he was like, if you go, you can't come back. Knowing that he's going to be worried sick the minute I step out. But anyway, you know, we're facing off with each other. And I'm like, all right. So I leave. I leave and then go down there. Almost got gang raped. Down there, it's like, I want to go home. No, it's time. It's time to take me back home. I'm ready to go home. I should not have been there. But when I was coming back, my mom was able to find me. I went and lived at these Valencia apartments. And a girl named Tamara Chung decided to invite me to church. Me to church. Me. Jarastafara Haley Selassie I church. No, no, we don't do that. We don't church. We do Selassie. Okay? That's who we are the Cohens. We are red, gold, and green. Our house gate was red, gold, and green. Our stairs had red, gold, and green going up. We had Rastafari right in the front. Make sure when we come down the stairs, that's who we saw. And you want me to go to the Jesus church? We don't know, ma'am. We are not jesus -ing. You know, so I came out and, and ended up going to, uh, she bribed me. You know, she was like, what do you think going to happen? You're going to get saved or something? I was like, y'all can't save me. So I decided to go to show her how I could not be saved. Yeah, I'm going to show you. If you think God can do something with this, whoa. So I went up there to the church on the rock, up on Clifton Drive. And I sat in the back of the church because I didn't even know why I was there. I was trying to win a bet. I didn't have the church closed or nothing, but I went. I was going to see which club right after. That was the plan. So I barred her church clothes, had my real clothes underneath, you know, drop it like it's hot clothes right under that. Yes, that's it. And then, um, and then, you know, the pastor, uh, Andrew Keene, decided he was going to preach on John 3.16. And I don't know. I don't know. I can't tell you. I feel like I blacked out. I don't know what happened. I opened my eyes and I was at the altar. I opened my eyes and I was at the altar. And his wife was praying with me, say this prayer. And I am praying the prayer, but I don't even know it's a prayer, you know. I don't know what's happening with you. All I remember was God love you. God love you. I said, like, oh, me? Oh, yeah, I want that. I am on that. I want it. And that's all I went. I went for the love of God. And ended up getting the God of love. <laughs> and my whole life changed. My whole life changed. It wasn't short after that, that, you know, a couple years later into that, my mom got stabbed to death in Stony Hill. And that was the worst situation ever. And yet... Before she died, she was a born-again believer. Not on crack anymore, not on drugs anymore. Fully redeemed, fully restored. You know, and between all of that, you know, I had been molested. I had been assaulted. This is something we don't talk about here in Jamaica. We don't like to really go down to those places. But it happens more often than we want to confess. And you learn to play avoidance. You just avoid the people. Because you can't really tell the people. Because let me tell you, I know for me, if I had even told my dad at that time, he would be in prison because he would just kill them. He wouldn't even think twice. He would just be that boom, boom, boom. That would be it. And he wasn't saved. So it's not like he had Holy Spirit then kind of tempering him down. I mean, I told you what we were. It's Jar Rastafari. So he would have just talk, take his locks, choke them. Something would have happened. So, that, so I just never really you know, say anything about it. So as time is going on, I'm realizing things keep happening, right? These very epic, bad things. Because the murder of your mom, you know, and then I had to go and all the, the blood had run through all the tiles on the veranda. And, and you cannot get that out your head. You cannot get the smell. You cannot get the view. You cannot, it, no matter what you do, you can create different things in your brain. But that is a black spot in your brain. Time goes on and then, you know, I move, I get married and stuff. And years into there, then the pastor I'm under ends up assaulting me and 20 other women. And I'm the last victim, big federal case. Now I'm in a court system. What the heck is happening here? Lord, why? How did this happen? How do you get rohypnol and these things happening? You have no memory. You don't know what is happening. 
So you see now molestation and assault and now it's escalating. And you have to say to yourself, is this who I am? Am I always attracting drama and trauma into my life? Because that's what people do, right? You begin to kind of put it in your mind that it's your fault. You begin to put it in your head that it is your fault, right? But I just started getting shook. Just shook. And I don't know if you have ever been in a place where you're just like, okay, there's, that's enough. That's, that's enough. No, like, no, like if you want to draw a line, no would be a great time to draw a line. And it would be wonderful if you turn this thing around and let me see that scripture that all things will turn around and work for my good. God, no would be a good time for you to show me because I can't take anymore. My threshold is full. I am maxed out. There is no more space and I can feel my face shaking. And so we begin to build and things go on. And then two years ago, I ended up getting divorced. And I felt I needed to. And I felt that I made the right decision. And I did all the steps and I did all of those things. And I knew that God had told me to hold my peace and hold my course. And he told me, unless you're going to empower, you are never to tell your story. Because if your story is to expose and distract and destroy, that is you don't have permission to do that. So now I had to sit down and take the assaults and take the blame and take the shifts. And I had to now then be expelled and isolated and rejected out of somewhere and someplace. I've spent 30 years building and developing and I'm going, God! pick somebody else I've served you since I was 15 I don't have any other degree all I wanted to do was tell people about the love of God I had no other agenda in my life that was it and I said you know what no I'm going to isolate this thing is breaking me beyond recognition. I'm not who I am. I'm doing things I'm not supposed to be doing. I'm in places. I'm, in, I'm just isolated. I'm pulling away. Because I don't know the very people that I have developed and trained. I can't even reach them. I, they can't even reach me. What is going on? And I'm in church. But see, I wasn't raised in church. So I don't know politics of church. All I know is I went to a church and they said, God loves you. That's all I know. I don't care about the resurrection that happening with, the, um, with the, the horses and the blue horse and the red horse. It don't matter to me when they come. It don't matter to me if I get raptured tomorrow or mid-rapture or post-rapture. All I want to know is a God of all creation who he said he would be. Will he do what he said he would do? I want to know God in all these things that you want to get caught up in I'm not all up into that where is God and I'm like Lord I don't think I'm gonna make it for the first time in my life I think I'm going to take my life I'm just gonna drive over this bridge and jump up and just make the car just go I have never felt hopeless in my entire life when people say they feel hopeless I didn't have no understanding because I'm like a bucket full of sunshine I'm like what are you talking about hopeless no but when I'm that bridge and I made three phone calls. So sometimes you say, why does she call somebody? Sometimes we are calling. You're just not picking up your phone. Sometimes you just don't want to be interrupted with our stress and our drama. Not knowing you may have been the fifth call that day. And you go, man, she just called me. What happened? But I just kept pressing and I, the last call was like, a Pastor Sarah. You always say, even in this God is able, I said, uh-huh, mm, mm, mm. And then my counselor finally called me, and he said, no, 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 no. You, you, we're not going to do this, and he talked me out of it. But then after the whole process, I remember just like, man, this is too much. So I wanted to run away. But I don't know about you, if you know about girl math. Girl math says, if you run, God can't catch you. It's not true. It's almost like when you close your eyes and think that people can't see you. <laughs> you ever do that? Like, <laughs> you close your eyes and go, they don't see me. No, you don't see them. <laughs> they clearly see you. And so I was looking for help. I needed some help. I needed to know, okay, God, if we're going to do this thing, is there anybody in the Bible that is a female that is going through something like I'm going through? Just talk to me. So he, he gave me some examples. So Genesis 16. Genesis 16 verse 7. 
And the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarah, where have you come from? And where are you planning to go? I'm like, what? So Sarah, you divorced woman. Where, where you come from? And where are you planning to go? Like, like where are you running? I said, far. Far is the word. Operative word, far. <laughs> far. You know what I mean? Like when you go on the scale and they're, they're looking at digits. I just look and go, fine. I don't want no numbers on that scale. If it's 170, 100, no, I just say F-I-N-E. That's the only number I'm looking at. You know, you're just, you're just denying. You're just in denial. Like, I don't want to be here. So she says, you know what? I'm running away. I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah. I'm running. That, I'm telling you what I'm doing. So I'm saying to the girl, I'm saying, I'm looking at myself going, Lord, I told you, pick somebody else. Pick somebody else. I don't want to do it no more. I am just going to find something else to do. You can just take this whole ministry thing. There's like, you know, there's 6 billion people in the world. Somebody else wants to sign up for this. I have, I have laid a foundation. Let them build on it. This is me to the Lord. All right? I'm running away. So then the angel of the Lord said, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, this is just one of the parts right here. I will increase your descendants so much that there'll be too numerous to count. Now that may not mean a lot to you, but Genesis 15, 1, a God says to Abram, hey, Abram, let me tell you something. Your descendants are going to be like the stars. They're going to be too much for you to count. And then God comes over to the slave girl and says, let me tell you something. The same promise for Sarah is the same promise for you. Just because your situation look rough, Hagar, don't mean that I have not seen you. Don't mean I haven't promised you. Don't mean I'm not going to come through for you. Let me tell you, you may look at Sarah and say, oh, she on the glow up. But I'm telling you, I am the God. El Roy, I see you and yes Sarah Melinda you are out here and you're isolated and you're all alone and it seems like you're running away but I'm telling you the promise I made on your life was not determined upon your future or your past it's because I said it if I said I was going to do something I said it you can run if you want my purpose remains and the angel of the Lord said listen you will give birth to a son his name will be Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. Woo! Oh, the Lord has heard of your misery. How many of you would like to know that the Lord has heard of your misery? Not just known, but the Lord has heard it has traveled. That girl in a bad way. That situation's a tough thing. She need her business to grow. She need her marriage to fix. The Lord has heard. And when the Lord has heard, the Lord will deliver. The Lord will always answer. It may not feel like it. It may not look like it. But I'm here to tell you, the Lord has heard. Verse 13, and she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. I have seen him. So see, you can know about God. But there's some situations that make you have to know God. You can be taught him and then you can learn him for yourself. It's a different thing when you know him for yourself. It's a different thing when you know that you know when nothing else can move any mountains. You know you good. The God who has heard you and the God who sees you, he is going to make a way. There's something on the inside that just cannot take an encounter with God away from you. Oh, and it says here, so Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. And he was 86 years old when Abram, Hagar bore him. So... If you don't watch it, you make something last longer. So how are you going to change it? How are you going to change it? How are you going to change it? So let me tell you. I was in this kind of way. And I was talking to my dad. Because I, I'm, like, I'm, like I said, all that I had known for a long time had just disappeared. And I just was floored. I couldn't even understand. My brain couldn't even connect the dots. And I was talking to him. And, you know, he said, Sarah. So let me ask you something. Like, just like, sorry, so let me ask you something. I said, eh? I said, because I was living in an apartment, no. So I was leaving 9,000 square feet, right? $2 million house, two Bentleys, two Mercedes, 
one Range Rover, all in the same house, because we can drive that many cars at the same time. Okay, all right, and three acres of land, private gated community, so you understand? It's not like you just decide, oh, I'm gonna walk in. Some people can stay for that, but listen, that, that was my portion. I was okay, but I was living in an apartment. I'm giving you the contrast. There, here. And my dad said to me, so do you feel different in the apartment? I said, no. I said, remember, I used to live on Trenchtown on First Street. Like, how different can you feel? I mean, that was like the lowest in terms of where your living space is. Not the lowest in my life because I really had a great time in Trenchtown. I mean, the most real, authentic. You know what you get. What you get, is what you see is what you get. There's no hypocrisy. What you see is what you get. Nobody going to backbite you because you're clear. They're telling you up front, me, I'm going to bite you. No, me, I'm going to bite you tomorrow, Tuesday, Tuesday at 3 o'clock, right here. So, no, you're somewhere like up at St. Andrew. Hi, well, you know, I'll just I'll invite you later. No, maybe not. But down there, no, it's very straight, right? So here it is. I'm in there. And then the second question he said. So have you lost vision for yourself? I said, no. I said, no, I haven't lost vision for myself. You're going to be fine then. You're going to be fine. So when you're turning transition, that was a defining moment for me. Because... I said to him, Daddy, who going to have like a divorced person who is a female, who is a preacher, who is an all... Right? This is me talking to him. Who going to do all of that? So then he says to me, I should give him some money, you know. He was a really good counselor that day. <laughs> <laughs> so then he said to me, so what would it be like? What would your attitude be like if those things didn't exist at all? If you didn't even know those things? If you didn't know and weren't aware that those were things, how would you behave? I said, oh, hold up. I'm putting the restriction on myself. I'm limiting myself. My vision is there, but it can only be accomplished to the degree that I actually remove the restrictions from myself. The God, God vision don't change. His strategy may change. When Jesus was over there and the angel said, listen, you want to take him out of here and move him into Egypt? Go hide him. Now, he was still the son of God. His plan was still to make him the savior of the world, but he had to shift his direction. So sometimes the strategy changes even if the source file doesn't. And so when he was saying that, I began to think. I began to think. So when you're trying to change your trauma and you're going through a transition, you have to understand that in every transition, you can look at it one or two ways. If you drive a stick, right, and not an automatic, you understand that when you're going up the hill, you cannot go in fourth gear. Now, if you did that, some you were not taught well. You have to actually gear down to go up. So sometimes what looks like a loss <laughs> is really a setup. Sometimes when you are in aisle 2A of the plane and you need to use a restroom in the back, it looks like you're going backward, but you're still going to your destination. Don't be tricked by what it looks like. Don't be fooled by your pruning season. Sometimes a loss is really just a setup for the next situation. And I began to see, how can I transition in this? And I began to look in my hand and say, oh, but I'm a smart person. I've built a $12 million business. What you talking about? I will not have to wait for you to create a platform for me. I'll make one for myself. The first group of people I ever preached to was a banana grove in Montego Bay. I was at Christ for the Nations, standing in front of them thinking they were all of y'all. And I was preaching. I preached Hebrews, run your race well. That was my first sermon to the banana trees. I was like, I preached to trees before. I sure can make me a platform and preach to some people. So I began to just create my woman's ministry again. And I began to just say what was in my hand. And the Lord was like, Moses, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? You can redefine and rebrand yourself at any time. That stick that Moses had, what did he do? He opened up the Red Sea with it, right? And then that same stick, he held it up and the Amalekites started to lose, right? And that same stick, he put it over Egypt and some plagues came, right? And that same stick hit the water on the rock, right? So listen, whatever you have in your hand, you can rebrand at any time because the gift is you your asset is you the Holy Spirit has put everything that you and I need to live life and live life more abundantly so I began to shift so in a transition you have to start looking what do I have in my hand not what's left but what's remained because how many of you know 
That if God can build a whole human race off of some dust, he sure can change your life because you have some gifts and talents left in your hand. You have some experience. You have some connections. You have some abilities that you can use, right? So number one, you're going to have to go make your struggle your stage. Make your struggle your stage. You stand up on it and you own it and you go, yeah, that's it. It's me. So you get your vision back. What is it that you really wanted to do? Where is it that you really wanted to go? What are the things God had put in your heart? No, you're not too old to do it. No, it's not past the time. No, it's still something that he has in your heart. You've gotten discouraged through your situation. You've got, you know, pushed back because of your, your exhaustion. But I'm here to remind you, no, re-amp up your vision. Look with eyes and see what is remaining. So I went back. And I made my vision louder than my situation. You see, when Hagar went up into that desert, the angel came and said, listen here. See that boy over there under that tree? The Bible says, and the Lord heard the voice of the boy, not the voice of Hagar who was crying. Because the boy was her vision, her promise. And your vision and your promise is also going to cry out to God. Even when you don't have the right words. Even when you don't know what to say. The seed that he's put in you is crying and going, I will not die in this desert. You made a promise to me in chapter 16, God, that I was going to be a multitude. My name is Ishmael and I need you to hear me. You called me and you're going to bless me. So I don't know where you are in your life and you're giving up and you're, you're backing down. And you're kind of making your mission. Maybe God don't want me to do that. So let me make it smaller. Maybe not. Make it, make it smaller. Maybe not. You are trying to make your vision go down to the place where you're not afraid of disappointment, where you can handle the disappointment. So if it doesn't happen, you shrink back going, oh, all right, it's not a big loss. But that is not faith. Faith says I'm going all the way in. I'm going to fill those jars to the brim. There is no room for error. There is no room for doubt. Because when he come and bless this water in my jar, it's going to feed so many people. So no, I'm going to go bigger. I'm going to go bolder. I'm going to press further. So number one, you have to keep your vision. Number two, do an inventory. Everything that you have, every connection you know. I started saying, okay, what do I have? I've written curriculum. I've been a visionary. I've done this, right? I started thinking. Then one of the things I realized I had in my, in my arsenal of things was a spirit. The Bible says that Paul said to Timothy, hey, the spirit of your grandmother and your mother was on you. And I realized I came from a history of strong people. I, I, I wasn't born in America. I'm from here. And I started looking back and going, hold up. I remember when we used to have them phone cards. And people used to heat the phone card. And when you heat the phone card and you put it in the phone, you had unlimited credit. I said, hold on. I'm from an intelligent, ingenious, creative people. You can make every muckle with a mickle. Sarah, hold up. I said, hold up. I started looking and going, I don't recall my dad ever working for somebody. I don't recall my mother working for somebody. And she had these stints, but I don't recall her overall working for somebody. I don't recall my bonus mom working for nobody. I don't come from people who don't create vision and do it. My dad is here still talking about, oh, so what we're going to do next year is this. Sir, aren't you supposed to sit down now? Like, no, it's sit down, cross your leg time. No, we want to go to Denby. And sir, let me tell you what's happening in Denby. Okay. And fun in the sun is coming. No, still? You still find the fun in the sun? And I started to remember I have a spirit in my inventory. And that spirit say, you can still create. You can still do. You're from a strong people who have survived so many different things. You will not fail. You cannot fail. It is impossible for you to fail. And began to believe that. And number three, you have to come into agreement with it. You have to actually agree with it. Whatever you agree with becomes covenant in your life. And if you don't agree with it, then you're disagreeing with it. So you can't be wishy-washy. See, you have some angels. The Bible says, I've given you some angels charge over you. 
So when it says, and the, the angels do whatever his word is, right? So here it is. You start with your angels. Lord, I thank you. I lift you on high. I'm blessed and highly favored. Oh, and the windows of heaven are opening. And the angels are like, yeah, we like that. Let's do it. And then you're like, Lord of mercy, time's hardy. Angels like, whoa, roll it back. And then you're like, yes, I'm going for that promotion. We on it. We on it. Right. Lord, I'm going to pick her. And said, well. So your angels are like in a calypso dance. They're going to go forward and back and they're just stuck. They're in one place. But when you finally come into agreement and say, no man, we're going, I put my application in, but they're going to pick her. Pick who? No, so I'm the right one for this. I'm the right one. Yes, we take one more step further. Oh, well, you know what? That's what you do. You have to kind of keep going. Come into agreement with it. Come into agreement with it. So what did I do? Got my vision. Rebranded myself. Right? I am still who I am. I will always do what I'm supposed to do, which is to preach the gospel. That will never change. That cannot change. It's a life source of who I am. I went and got my real estate license. Running up my credit card. Because, listen here now, the man who bought my house still haven't paid me for the house. It's two years. So I got like six figures on six figures out in somewhere in the sky, in the atmosphere. So when people normally separate them, have them kind of fall back. No fall back. Fall into place, but no fall back. So when they did that, and um, got my real estate license. Asked me if I do anything with it. You know what I did with it? I got my house with it. <laughs> but check this now. How you going to get a house with no job? Why? How do you get a whole house? Not a part of a house. A house that's in your name, legally, and before the law, with no job. No validation of income. Won't he do it? The same house my son sketched out on the thing. I want a house like this. Oh. Number one, you rebrand. You decide that you're not going to give up. I decided, listen, I'm going to take all my pastoral years. And what they was doing for free, I'm just going to have to charge, you know. Too bad. I just have to charge you. I know that you want me to just inspire you all the time, but I have to eat. So no, okay? So no, that's it. Well, you shouldn't be charging for church. Well, you know what? That's great. That, then, you know, you're not my client. And it's okay. There's somebody else for you. It's just not me. But my 30 years of stress, trauma, rape, abandonment, hunger, abuse, assault, all that. Oh, we're not going to do it for free anymore. So that's, not, that's just not going to happen. But it's okay. Because there's 6 billion people in the world that I told the Lord, pick somebody else. And I was like, oh, wait, those 6 billion people looking for me too. They are looking for me. They, they want me. So I began to do that. I began to coach. I just began to diversify. Because you know, if you only have one source of income, you're one decision from being broke. Well, I'm the primary caretaker and supplier for my son, so I can't afford to be broke. And then about 35 days later, maybe 40 days now, uh, I decided to go into digital products on January 19th. I've already made $43,000 US in, since then. It's not even been two months. Because everything I'm touching will prosper. So I brought this to let you see. see you got to be like this. You see, under here. What are, you, what are you standing on is my challenge to you. Carlene sings a song that was written by Pastor David called Triumph. You're causing me to triumph. Once again. Always causing. So when they're like, you're single, you're not going to make it. You're a single mom. See me here? What? I come right back up. The Lord says, in all my ways I'll acknowledge him. I will eat the good of the land. Oh, you know what? It's just not going to work. Whatever I touch my hands to is going to prosper. You know what I'm going to tell you? You're going to be stressed. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be full of anxiety. He gives his beloved good sleep. You got to come back. You know, he's going to be like, well, well, who's going to hire you? He will make a way in the desert. He called crooked ways to make straight and high places to make low. You see, on the base of who you are, you got to know who he is. And I'm here just to remind you, when you're having a traumatic situation, it's a segue for transition. And you can take that transition and you can make it a triumph. And your triumph is only dependent on how you handle that transition. So it's up to you to handle that transition well. Amen? Amen. Thank you for having me so much. I will be outside at the table, but apparently we have like some minutes for some question and answers. If you would like Q&A. Pastor so Sarah. You can find me on the gram at I am Sarah Cole.
CO. John. Now, I, can I just? Can't, yeah, can't move you. Can't move you. Yeah. I shall not that be That nice. Nicey, do we have any questions for Pastor Sarah? You have a question? Anybody? Speak quickly. You actually are, very, you actually are extremely clear. I do have to say, we all feel like we were coached. Not for free, <laughs> but this wasn't a coaching session. I do a lot of things for free, Alicia. Yeah. No, Last you do, year, you do. I gave away 51% of my income. Yep. My job is to live, to give, and yep. give, to live. So it's Talk not like about I just like it. to make money just for myself. I do like to make money, though, because I have things to do. Like, I want to build a school in Trenchtown, you know. I have, a, I have an idea. I have, like, things to do. I can't just do it like what I'm um, just, just, just osmosis. So we have a question back here. Father, give me the answer in Jesus' name. Yes. Mm. Hi, everybody. My name is Simone Matheson, coming all the way from Montego Bay with my crew. All right. So I wrote this in green because I really needed to speak to it just a little bit more for me. What do you do when you realize that you are attracting drama and trauma? Yes. Like you're, you're moving forward, you're progressing, you know that you should go get what you should get, but you keep on attracting this drama and trauma, like in every space. Yeah, I think several things. Some things we know are an attack, right? Not everything is attack. Some things are an attack that happen because you're doing something well, you're on the right way. There, you, you kind of evaluate, there's nothing that should bring that, right? Two, there's some things that are cycles or familiar spirits or familiar patterns or generational curses. And those things you find out from interviewing those that have gone before you. So you find that if you had a miscarriage, maybe your mother had a miscarriage, maybe her mother had a miscarriage, then you realize you're in a generational cycle. That you have to actually break. You have to just focus on it and put your faith on it and say, listen, Jesus has made a curse on the tree for me, so no curse can stand here. I will break that generational curse and we create a new generational line of blessings. My fruit shall be good. Good. my fruit shall be strong you know you begin to do that so that's one way so one is an attack one can be a cycle when you're talking about you x those out you can say to yourself what spirit do i carry on me yeah. If you carry a self-pity spirit, if you carry one that is um, unsure and you're not fully walking in confidence, then those things are going to try and attract a stick to you because it's really testing you. It's just trying to see. And so how do you change that? You begin to change your faith attitude. How do you look? How do you act? How do you sound? Whatever you say, understand that it really is going to happen. Why? Because your body has muscle memory. And when your body has muscle memory, just like your voice goes, it has echolocation, right? Your voice is going to to create things no matter what it is locating or dislocating what you speak will always happen there's a Japanese scientist that did a test on it it's called the the, um, the uh, hidden messages of water go read the book and it talks about the power of sound and how that it goes and it locates and so if you understand that your body is 70% 60% water and it's going to lodge into your system whatever you begin to say you know that it is morphing and dismorphing or creating and benefiting yourself so the power of sound is supernaturally in, in, incredible for God said and it was done God said let there be light and there was light God said so if you want to break that begin to change what you are saying I only attract the best in my life I am blessed going in, I'm blessed going up. You know, people that are connected to me are the right, in the right season. I have the right uh, team around me. I declare, I receive money comes to me consistently, habitually, without delay. I declare that I'm always promoted, that I am I'm omnipresent, not like God, but my business is everywhere. Uh, you begin to begin to express and declare that and understand that you're creating as you are speaking. Because you're, it's, that's the power word. So that's how I would change the cycle and say, okay, it looks like it, but I'm not going to. One, it's not. If it's a cycle, I can break it. Two, if it's an attack, I can pray through it. I just have to outlast the attack because God will fight it for me. And number three, if those are not the case, then I must now shift and change my new patterns by creating new habits. Right? It's like Netflix. When you go into Netflix, it's going to pull up things suggested for you. Continue watching for mom. All of these things. So it's based on the algorithm of input that you have put. 
But if you want to change the algorithm because you always watch documentaries and you begin to start watching romance shows, about the third time you'll start seeing romance shows pop up as suggestions for you. It's the same thing in your life. Whatever you're inputting out there, you can change it at any time, the algorithm of your faith, by inputting something else. Make sense? All right, I think we have question, um, time for one more question. She's behind you, Alicia, in your hot dress. Where are you going? <laughs> I learned from you. <laughs> Go away. Thank you. Great afternoon, Pastor Sarah. Hello. So I'm Kasima Harris. Yes, ma'am. All right, so a quick question. So been through some traumatic stuff. Believe I'm doing well, helping people. I'm a woman of faith as well. But recently, she was in deep worship. When I said she realm up, she realm up in other worship. We're on the phone. And I said, no man, she gone left me. So you know I'm worshiping as well on the other end. But then some deep stuff from I was probably six, seven, eight started unraveling. And I'm like, wow. Like, so I would have dealt with a number of it, been through deliverance. Like I said, I am mm -hmm. emotionally I'm good helping others. But this happened just this week, and it got really deep. And it was so much trauma as a child that I felt like it was being unpacked and my soul was being washed. And I'm like, why now would I go back here? And there are some things that I didn't even recognize how deep the trauma was as a kid. Uh, in your experience with dealing with trauma, uh, do you notice that you have to literally unpack all of it to move to that next higher level? That's I think several things. Number one, that there's renewing the mind and there's retraining the brain. And I know you have Dr. Caroline Leaf, no better person on that, right? So you have to retrain the brain. And sometimes those things come up because it's not necessarily that you didn't get deliverance and you didn't renew your mind. It's that your brain is a muscle. And when some things trigger it or uncover it, it brings it back up to you. You have to now decide what you want to do with it. So when it comes up, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are, you are not delivered or you're not healed or you're not in faith. It just means that it, it, another layer has on scold. So in worship, you get really sensitive and really vulnerable before the Lord. And so a lot of times that's where you can pour out your heart for the Lord. And in that space, those things may come up. But then you know, okay, you make a conscious decision because you're aware now. You can say, okay, what do I want to do with this? I can cry it out. I can pour. That's why he says pour your complaints out. If we didn't have any complaints, he wouldn't say cry them out. So we're clearly going to have some. So, but we, sometimes you, when you're going through trauma recovery, doesn't mean that you know that you've unpacked everything. Because sometimes everything cannot be unpacked. Sometimes it, it's so traumatic, you can't actually handle all of the unpacking at one time. Because we're not just traumatized in one aspect. There's multiple different, there's micro traumas, right? So I would just say whenever it happens to you, just decide, okay, this maybe is just an opportunity for me to pour it out to the Lord. But it doesn't mean that I have to take it back up. I can leave it right there. But retraining the brain, that's part of it too. It's like emptying that out and saying, okay, who do I want to be after this now? What is the decision I'm going to make? I realize that. How will I, almost kind of when your strong man goes out, what you're going to fill it with? It's kind of like, just how do you want to be from this point? So for me, I feel like, yeah, different things come up, but then I can also discern in my own self when I'm going to slip back into self-pity. Lord, I just want to feel bad for myself. Or, okay, this is coming up. What I want to do with this. Okay, I, I'm just going to let it, I'm just going to give it a space. So emotions are like little two-year-olds that run in around her. You have to give them play pens. And I'll leave you with this. Anxiety is energy without a plan. Whenever you have a plan and a structure and an order, you'll find your anxiety will leave. So whenever you're feeling that, just give it a place. Find it a playpen and say, go on over there and go play. Amen. Right, God bless you. Thank you for having me.